Good morning on this absolutely spectacular day in Washington, D.C. Welcome the metropolitan Washington area. Listening in at 1480 WPWC Radio. Welcome to the Rock Newman Show. We have a great program for you today. Um, we're going to start the morning with uh, Council Member Muriel Bowser. Last week, um, just at the time that uh, the current mayor, Vince Gray, was on this program, uh, Muriel Bowser was announcing, council member uh, from Ward 4, Muriel Bowser, was announcing her candidacy to become the next mayor of Washington, D.C. So we're, I'm going to run down the lineup here and then come back and jump right in uh, with a full hour-long conversation uh, with a council member and mayoral candidate, Mayor, Mayor, uh, 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 Muriel Bowser. In the second hour, there is a raging controversy in hip-hop music. Rick Ross and Lil Wayne both have been thoroughly castigated and criticized for lyrics. Back in February, uh, Lil Wayne made some comments that everyone thought were demeaning and derogatory to the, to the, to the legacy of Emmett Till. And more recently, Rick Ross talks about slipping a molly in somebody's champagne and uh, she didn't even know it. And then he went home and he enjoyed it and she didn't even know it. Well, there's a radio station that is leading the charge in Michigan. Uh, it is WUVS 103.7, the, the beat, as in, in Muskegon, Michigan. They have pulled all of Lil Wayne's and Rick Ross's music from their rotation. Uh, there will be a number of folks here here discussing that particular issue and in the third hour a really um, interesting hour something that is relevant to all of us and to everyone in this society is parenting and we're going to do a show on parenting and my extremely special guest in studio will be Robert and Jackie Griffin and if you don't know them by name they are the parents of RG3 and his two daughters. They will be joining us here in studio at 1918 Martin Luther King Avenue, WEAC Radio. Also uh, joining us will be Sean Jeeves Shiram. He is a Harvard Fellow and a former Chief Resident of Pediatrics at UCLA. So let me give you the number in the event you'd like to join any of these conversations, all of which I promise you will be very interesting. Let me first say something about uh, Council Member Muriel Bowser. Uh, when I talked to her team, uh, Bill Lightfoot and Ben Soto, and then when I talked to Muriel, I was, if I can call you Muriel. Oh, please do. Welcome to the Rock Newman Show, Thank first you, of Rock. all. <laughs> Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. All right, when I uh, talked to, talk to them and talked to Muriel, I told them very candidly that I had made a declaration, and, and the declaration that I had made prior to Mayor Gray coming on, and when he was here, that it was my sense that if his performance the next two years equate to his performance in the two years since he's been in office, that I personally thought, in my humble or not so humble opinion, I thought that he might he, that he would deserve an additional four years, and I wanted you and your team to be aware of the position that I took, because I know saying that to some political candidates, they would say, "Hell no! You've all you said that. I don't want any part of this." And to your credit, and to your team's credit, that you did not flinch, and here you are. Let me welcome you once again to the Rock News well, Show. Well, thank you, Rock, and thanks for having me. And of course, we want the opportunity to talk to all voters all across the city. Even and I know you have a lot of uh, listeners all across the region about what our vision is for the District of Columbia. After all, that's what elections are all about. We have one every four years people go out um, and talk to voters about what they see for the future uh, of the city and that's exactly what we intend to do over the next year okay let's jump in because I'm gonna approach this interview as if you know for the most part folks from the area from Washington DC may not know who you are sure. so we want to know 
Mariel Bowser. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And, uh, and I want to go, like, as they say in that song, but I want to go way back, <laughs> way back. And that would be, I want to ask you, your first memory as a child. Wow. What's, the, what's like the first thing you remember? Well, I remember, you know, being with my family, I think probably are the first memories. I'm a child of this city, born and raised, grew up in North Michigan Park. There are five kids. Um, and we, we had a, a very D.C. Uh, experience, I would let, say. Let, let me ask you, like, I remember when I was uh, four years old, the ambulance coming to the house to get my father. And that was just that that's like seared in my in my head. Any one particular something like that that stands out good, bad, otherwise? Well, it's interesting. I just had this conversation last week. Somebody asked me, now, what, what was the first school you went to? And I went to Brookland School. And it's a big discussion about what's going to happen to Brookland School now um, in Ward 5. And I remember very distinctly, and I ran into this, this lady who had been the principal there, and she hadn't seen me since I was five years old. Um, and we had a chat. But I, I remember just the older kids at the school would do home ec and cook for us and come and share what they had down in, in Brookland School. Um, and now, full circle, uh, we have the opportunity to decide what's going to be the future of that school um, in the Turkey Thicket campus. If you keep on working, good things will happen. Absolutely. Um, Muriel Bowser's saddest moment as a child. I have to tell you, uh, Rock, I had, you know, the, the type of childhood I wish for every child um, in the city. And two parents that loved me, great example, um, great example of love and faith and what that can do in your life. Uh, I'm the youngest of five, so my next closest sibling is nine years older than me, and I'm the baby. Oh, you the baby. I'm the baby. So I have to tell you, I, I had it pretty good, uh, pr pretty good growing up. Us babies. Yes. Get some. I knew, I knew there was something I liked about you. Uh, us, us babies get some advantage. Yes. My uh, oldest brother is 12 years older than me. Okay. His nickname was Baby. Okay. My mom was 46 when I was born. Okay. And um, she said she told the doctor when uh, the doctor told her that she was pregnant. She said, oh no doctor, that's a that's got to be a very big mistake. Fast forward 40 years and Mike Wallace from CBS was interviewing her um, he, they did a, they did some 60 minutes did something on us and um, he asked her he said um, so what did you tell the doctor she said I told the doctor that oh no I can't be pregnant that must be a mistake he, and Mike Wallace being the mischievous guy that he was said well where's what happened to that mistake and she said he's sitting right over there. <laughs> so, so um, I understand sort of the, the benefits and sometimes what even might be the jealousies of the other siblings for what the for the benefits that the baby might get. Um, I, you know, I was going to ask you, and you may have described it even here now, because if I ask you, you know, the saddest moment, I've got to ask you, as a child, what was, is, was there a single most happy moment? Well, I'll, I'll tell you just kind of kind of skipping forward a little bit of my brother when he uh, introduced me last week for my announcement. He talked about one and, you know, I, I had, I was a grown woman by this time, um, but my, my folks had a really significant fire at their house. Mm. And um, I got a call from my mom and she was, you know, really, she said, you know, there's, you know, there's a fire in the basement. We called the, we called the police. I mean, we called the ambulance and 911 and they're on their way. Um, and we were trying to figure out what happened. Now, I live about five minutes from them. And as soon as I opened my door, I could hear the fire engine screaming towards their house. Mm. Um, and so by the time I got there, you know, a sense of calm had really come over me because I knew they were okay. And I knew that they were out of the house. Um, and I knew that whatever we found there, we would be able to fix. Um, so it's those types of memories. And when I think about uh, my family and how important it is um, and the, the value they instilled in me um, to be and love Washington. Um, I, I, I just, I, I know that's what we want to share all across the city. And I want to share the telephone number here if you want to be a part of the conversation. Give us a call on the Rock Newman Show at 202 889 9797. Let me do that again. 202 
889-9797. Now, you mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, going to uh, Brooklyn School. I did. Um, that's something else. In, in in us knowing Muriel Bowser, take us through. You went to, the, was, the, uh, was that elementary, junior high? No, I went there as a pre-K and a kindergartner. Uh, um, okay. And I will tell you, I, at the time, now, like, I'm the last of five. My sister is 16 years older than me. Mm -hmm. And my parents made the decision, both DC. CPS graduates, my mother from Cardoza, my father from Armstrong, um, that my sister was at Bunker Hill at the time. And my mom thought that she needed more, and we needed more. So they made the decision that time to take us in the parochial schools. Um, we're Catholic, and that's where I went all the way through high school. And so you went to Brooklyn all the way through high school? No, I went to Brooklyn, and I went to St. John's, and then I graduated from Elizabeth Seton. Oh, okay, okay. Now, so St. John's, what, 9 through 12? 1 through 8. Okay. And then I went to a school called the Academy of the Holy Names, which closed in my sophomore year, uh -huh. and I graduated from Elizabeth Seton. Is it true what they said about Catholic school girls? That were very smart and hardworking? No, that's it. Yes, it's <laughs> true. <laughs> uh, um, what? Who... During those years, prior to your getting to college, who was your favorite teacher and why? This gives me a chance to say my all-time favorite teacher in the world was Miss Gladys Nickens, and she's watching down in Jacksonville, Florida right now. So that's a shout-out to you, 10th grade English teacher extraordinaire. I love you. Who was your favorite teacher and why? Can I have two? Okay. Well, you can. All right. Um, one was my second grade teacher. Her name was Sister Betty. Um, and she was she was just extraordinary, and I, I, I remember till this day how she drilled in us the multiplication tables. Um, she drilled in us, you know, our, our reading and, and math, and I'll, I'll always remember that. But more than that, she taught us how to get along as as kids. Um, and, and one way that she socialized us was every month we had a taco party, um, and so that that was fun. My my next favorite teacher, I will have to say, um, her name was Patty. Parakini, um, and she taught me in the ninth grade. I forget it was it was so in, was that sister? No, Patty it was Miss Patty Parakini. Okay, and she uh, she taught us how to uh, to write in a way that honestly I still rely on some of uh, her techniques as a forty year old woman. Like what? Uh, just how to structure an argument and how to write, and it, it, it's instilled in me. Anytime I talk about schools and education, um, I don't care what you know focus you have in in high school. If it's STEM, if it's arts, I don't care what you study in college. Whether you're a liberal arts person like me, or you you study something more technical like engineering, I think we have to teach our children how to think critically, how to write well, and how to persuade others because those. Those, those qualities and that ability um, translates into so many things. Um, and I think we've lost that um, somewhat in, in how we educate our kids. You know, I've taken the position and I've written publicly, if you will, Facebook and other places, that aside from the parents in a home, I think the number one most important job in the world is that of a mom. And dad follows right behind that. But that the third single most important job is that of a teacher. Absolutely. The influence that they can have and that I know that teachers had on me, you know, it, it is something that I just always had such admiration for. So those kinds of things, I've got folks producers here telling me, you know, hey, let's start talking, let's get into the present about what's happening. But you know what? To understand a candidate that is going to lead the city, I frankly think that it's important to try to appreciate and understand and have information about backgrounds which which forms who you are today and the kind of leader that you're going to be. Sure. So, okay, so you uh, we're, we're, we're into high school and you went to college where and studied what? I went to college in Pittsburgh, a school called Chatham College, and there I studied history. I worked 
worked for a, a period of time in Pennsylvania. I was in the insurance industry. I quickly learned that that wasn't for me, uh, and I decided to come back home um, and go to graduate school. I went to American University, uh, where I, I have a master's degree in public policy. And your undergraduate degree? Is in history. Now, was Chatham a Catholic school also? No, it's not a Catholic school. It was a women's, it, when I was there, it was a women's liberal arts college. Um, and uh, focused on, you know, the arts and humanities and the liberal arts. Um, and I'm so grateful for, for that experience because um, when you when you're in a same sex uh, educational situation, you know all the women you see are in leadership. The president of the college, uh, the student government president. I had the opportunity while I was there to be the black student union president for uh, a couple of a couple of terms. And the leadership skills that I developed, I think, are are second to none. Is that your what you feel from your undergrad years? Your greatest takeaway is that was that the most important where you feel you started to develop real leadership skills there? Well, you know, Rock, I have to tell you, I probably have been running for something for a long time in high school and college. I was an ANC commissioner, um, and I've been privileged for the last six years to, to run and win three elections and to represent a, a great ward. So, yes, I think I've developed a lot of leadership skills along the way. Um, but looking at my folks, my first example of, of great liber leadership and uh, commitment to this city. Okay, so you come back, uh, you, you you find out quickly, like I did, that selling insurance, though in, in the insurance business, that that wasn't your call. wasn't for that me. Wasn't your that deep. wasn't my calling. I flirted with that shortly after college. Although, also. you know, I have to tell you, I worked for a great company, and they loved me, and I knew I could, you know, go far there, but I wanted to use my skills and talents to, to really do something that I love. So you come back to uh, D.C. Yep. You go to American University. I did. Uh, you get a degree in public policy. I do. What was was your great takeaway from that? I mean, what's how do you place that in terms of importance in your maturation process? Well, I, I think it's important uh, to to kind of to get focused on what you want to do. I think at that point I knew that I wanted to be in government, and and I think I knew that I wanted to be in local government. So I wanted to make sure that I got all the skills. Whether you know I went, went, was in a very uh, st statistics based program, um, so if I, if I say something, I want to figure out how I can prove it or gather the evidence. So, so that was important. We did a lot of focus on political theory, and local history even. I saw you had Paul Strauss here uh, yes. recently. He actually taught me a class at American University, Is that right? if you can believe it. Uh, and we, we did a lot of local D.C. Uh, history. I think even Marion Barry was a guest of the class. Um, at, at that time. So it was important to get grounded in statistics, get grounded in political history, so that when you, you talk about these things, there, there's some background there. Yeah. Okay, so we are through your career. Uh, um, now you've just graduated from, um, from grad school uh, at American University in Public Policy. Um, that gave you a foundation. Part of our foundation here at the Rock Newman Show is we have to pay some bills I hear you. from time to time. So we are going to take a break. I want to give you the telephone number. Call us up. We've got one line open at 202-889-9797. We'll see you after these very important messages. Find out when the discussion continues after this on The Rock Newman Show. My baby drives a pro hand cup. The weekend is here, and no matter what the weather's like outside, you'll find the deals inside here in the beautiful showroom of the all-new Pohanka Hyundai in Capitol Heights during their giant Markdown Madness sale. Smart shoppers know that every new Hyundai in Pohanka comes with Hyundai Assurance and America's best 10-year, 100,000-mile powertrain warranty. But why don't you tell them about the Markdown sale, Joe? I'll be happy to, Kim. Folks, shop around on the web, and you'll see lease payments on a new 2013 Elantra GLS at $179 a month. Today at Pohanka Hyundai, $99 a month. That's right, a $99 payment on a brand-new Elantra. 
Ultra. And 89 a month on a new 2013 Accent GLS Automatic. How do they do it, Joe? It must be the volume, Kim. A brand new building, hundreds of new Hyundais, and Pohanka's low payment and easy credit programs are designed to get everybody driving. But you have to get here today. Rush to the giant Markdown Madness sale at Exit 13 off the Capitol Beltway. Pohanka Hyundai, king of the Beltway. All financing for a limited term on approved HMF credit. My baby drives a Pohanka. The sweet potato pie. Mm, 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 mm. Even the keenest taste buds will tell you the best food on the planet. Large enough to serve you and small enough to know you. So get the Henry's at 5431 Indian Head Highway, Oxen Hill, Maryland, or no, give us a call at 301 749 6856. Giving you the real on everything from politics, sports, and common everyday life issues. This is The Rock Newman Show. I'm Gary Johnson, former governor of New Mexico. Last year, my state became the 12th state to allow medical use of marijuana by patients who are seriously ill. Some people were surprised that a Republican governor supports medical marijuana, but I'm hardly alone. Groups like the American College of Physicians, American Nurses Association, and American Public Health Association have all acknowledged the medical value of marijuana. New research about medical marijuana is coming out almost every day, showing remarkable potential in all sorts of serious conditions including cancer, AIDS, and chronic pain. But some in government still want to put politics and ideology ahead of public health. To learn more about medical marijuana and what you can do to help, contact the Marijuana Policy Project at 1-877-JOIN-MPP or visit them on the web at mpp.org. Thanks. Friends, David Schuster here, and all of us at WEAC Radio are so proud of our neighbors here in Southeast D.C., especially one of our partners, The Ark. The Ark is at 1901 Mississippi Avenue Southeast. It's the home to some of Washington's best, including the Washington Ballet, the Levine School of Music, Boys and Girls Club, and the Children's Health Project all provide a number of programs and services within the very same facility. The Ark is also home to the Ark Theater, the only theater east of the river, which hosts a variety of dance, music, and theatrical shows each year. Almost everything you could want is at the Ark, so stop by and see them. The Ark, 1901 Mississippi Avenue in Southeast. For more information, visit The Ark's website, www.thearkdc.org, or call 202-889-5901. The Ark, part of Southeast D.C. Real talk, real issues, real life. I got a new shirt in town. We now return to The Rock Newman Show. This is me. Um, I can't wait till until the um, until we going to DC in a couple couple days away. Um, I love you and I miss you so much. I can't wait. Bye. Love you. Let us come right back. Let us come right back. We've got a lot to get uh, through here today. Um, right now in studio is uh, Ward 4 uh, Council Member for Washington, D.C., Muriel Bowser. And on last Saturday, she threw her hat in the ring, was the first uh, candidate to announce for uh, the run for mayor of Washington, D.C., which I have, from an up-close perspective call the most difficult job in America. <laughs> um, let me ask you, first let me give out the number again, 202-889-9797. Today is March 30th. 
2013. It is a spectacular day here in sunny Washington, D.C. and the DMV area. So, Muriel, if I can come back to you, what was your motivation and inspiration to get into the topsy-turvy, crazy world of elected politics? Well, you know, Rock, I, I like I, I said, I always knew I'd be in government. I always knew I'd be in local government, but I, I didn't always know that I'd be in elected office. Um, until I got in local government. I worked in Montgomery County and around this region uh, for, for 10 years in various uh, capacities and transportation planning and downtown uh, redevelopment. Um, and then I ran for a volunteer elected position in my own neighborhood as an advisory neighborhood commissioner. Um, and then it became very clear to me that the can best... I, can I stop you for a second? Yeah. Because I know a lot of people see the letters ANC. Sure. And not so often do they know even what ANC means. Tell us what ANC stands for sure and what an ANC member does well in our uh, our home rule charter created a uh, elected position called advisory neighborhood commissioner yes. um, and it's a completely uh, volunteer there's no pay involved um, but your name uh, would appear on the ballot every two years and your neighbors can decide if they want you to represent them um, uh, ANC commissioner in the district uh, represents about 2,000 voters um, and the, the positions are completely advisory so um, and, and they can comment on anything from uh, zoning issues to the budget to ABC at, uh, the, our ABRA board issues involving liquor and wine licenses um, and they are entitled to by law great weight and what great weight means is a district official has to look at what they've said um, and if we don't agree with what we they've said we have to tell them why uh, or we have to incorporate um, their recommendations into our policy decisions you know one thing probably you just educated a lot of folks in DC who again see those letters but really they, they just don't know what it means um, let us go to the line we've got we're getting backed up here so let us go to the line we have Karen on from Washington DC you're on the line please turn your radio down and speak clearly hello thank you for taking my call I was calling uh, to ask uh, council member Bowser a question and the question is uh, what are some of your most um, some of your most um, favorite accomplishments on the council so far? Sure. Well, I've had the opportunity on the council to... Uh, thank, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen, to uh, have leadership in a variety of issues. First, um, as the chairwoman of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, where we really pushed through comprehensive foreclosure legislation um, that protected D.C. residents um, from predatory lenders and required mediation. I uh, had the opportunity to chair the Parks and Recreation Committee uh, for a short time, but we were still able um, to get something through that I think is going to be very important for the district in the long run that will allow our parks to generate revenue to support our programs. Um, and I most recently was the chair of the Committee on Government Operations, where our big responsibility was to pull together ethics reform legislation for, uh, for the entire city um, at a very critical time. And so we were able to, to do that. Um, now, I, I think I have the responsibility that's closest uh, to, to my passion, and that's being the chair of the Committee on Economic Development, where we're going all across the city um, and making sure, like great quarters, like Martin Luther King Avenue, Georgia Avenue, Rhode Island Avenue, are getting the type of attention um, in public investment, um, as well as uh, you know private investment, to make those corridors great. You know, you mentioned, um, and, and again, thank you, caller. Thank you, Karen. Um, thank you. You, um, you mentioned ethics reform. Mm -hmm. And there has been the criticism, I would suggest that a lot of it valid, perhaps some of it over the top, of our local elected officials. Um, and, you know, here at the Rock Newman Show, you know, we name names. You know, we, we, we talk about the real stuff, 
because I think we should. Um, the ethics reform that you initiated, that you authored, that you sponsored, is is that the, the what you have done and what has been established from that initiative? Is that something that, uh, by its very nature, would have prevented the kind of chicanery of uh, of Harry of, of what uh, Harry Thomas? got involved in? Well, actually, Rock, well, what our legislation does and what all good legislation to, should do is look to the future and prevent or do as much as possible to prevent bad activity. Um, I think we know that if somebody's been on breaking the rules, they're going to do it no matter what. Um, but what our um, what our law does is set up a new regime, a board um, that is empowered to investigate and investigate independently um, any violations of our code of conduct. It sets up very specific um, penalties um, to to address that behavior um, and that's important too. We were also able to better fund our Office of Campaign Finance um, so that they are just not reacting but they're proactively making sure um, that, that the rules are enforced. I think it's a great step um, in making sure we have a robust system of rules and people to enforce them to give the public um, a, a better sense of, of trust for their public officials. Who's been the most influential person in your political career? Well, there there have been uh, so many people that have um, inspired me uh, along the way, and I, I we can look at to our own ward for for great examples of people. Charlene Jarvis, who led our, our ward for 20 years, Adrian Fenty, who set an example of uh, top constituent services, uh, Linda Crop, who was a, a woman leader of the council, who people still miss uh, her leadership uh, on the on the city council, and certainly um, we at Admire, I admire what Tony Williams was able to do in setting bold goals and a vision that we're now seeing um, pay dividends all across the District of Columbia, um, which is so important. Uh, but I was just with my friend here in Ward 8 uh, for his State of the Ward address um, and the, the, his uh, inspiration to a lot of people in our city is, is also important and that we have to make sure that as we grow, we're bringing everybody along with us and not leaving whole neighborhoods and whole wards you, behind. You said your friend in Ward 8. Mm -hmm. Who are you referring to? The the council member oh, oh. and the former mayor. Oh, you're talking about Mar 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 Marion Barry. Marion Barry. <laughs> and you're talking about Marion Barry. <laughs> That's who I'm talking about. <laughs> um, the uh, Karen asked, and you had a chance to elaborate on a question I was going to ask sure. was about your biggest triumph. Was mm -hmm. it was it anything else? I mean, I thought you I thought you covered that. Was yeah, well, I wanted to talk about certainly what uh, the, the things that we were done down on the council in terms of legislation. I think the biggest job of a legislator is to fill the gaps in the law. Uh, not to go over the top. And we, we, we do that on the council sometimes. The, the number of laws that we pass that don't have any impact on people's lives, I, I think is, you know, we need to watch out for. But we've also had tremendous success um, in our ward. And when I look across Ward 4, I know that we can have those successes in, in other places. We have, we have issues with neighborhood development. You know that you've heard people say, what's going to happen with Georgia Avenue for 40 years? Yeah. And finally, we're starting to see those types of investments in new grocery stores and the total transformation of, of the Walter Reed campus and new housing being built that's affordable and is for seniors. Um, and that's what we need to see uh, across the city. I was going to do it in the reverse order, but since Karen asked the question first, you know, and you've had a chance to elaborate on that, what's your biggest disappointment as a politician? Wow. My biggest disappointment, I guess, is that we, we, we can't move fast enough. Um, when we look at our school reform efforts, for example, we've made some big changes. We've invested in um, and we made the tough decision for mayoral control of our, our schools, which gives the mayor and the, the chancellor the singular line of accountability to get things done. We've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in school construction. Um, yet, five years later, the, the the improvements and outcomes for children has been stubborn um, and the investments across the city have been unequal um, so I would uh, as, as mayor redouble my efforts 
uh, to make sure that we're investing equally across our city um, and we're setting the big goals. Uh, we, instead of seeing the gap between black kids and white kids get smaller, we've seen it get bigger. And that's unacceptable. Okay, here's what I want to do. I want to go, um, Mayor Gray left a document and it's the Gray administration uh, year two report. And I'll kind of quickly read through this. That when Ma uh, Mayor Vincent Gray took office January 2011, he promised to focus on creating jobs, reducing unemployment, and growing the district economy while educating and preparing residents for jobs in emerging industries, improving the quality of life for all of our residents. Throughout his two years in office, using the One City Action Plan as a guide, Mayor Gray has continued aggressively to move D.C. forward towards his vision of a more prosperous, equitable, safe, sustainable sustainable city for all on Mayor Gray's watch. Now, I'd like for you to react to these things here. It, uh, he has uh, five bullet points. The district's economy is booming, with more than 28,000 private sector jobs created over the past two years and the unemployment rate falling by nearly three percentage points. Now, do you see that? You agree with that? You disagree with that? What kind of reaction do you have to that? Well, I think that we've seen the national unemployment rates go down, and we have to thank President Obama for his commitment to uh, spending when spending was very important um, in uh, some some tough economic times. So I'm grateful uh, that uh, we've had that kind of federal government spending, which has you know helped with our contractors that, that rely on the federal government to keep people employed and to even hire hire additional people. Um, so so that's important. I also though know that we have to focus on while in some parts of the city unemployment is is at the national average or below the national average like in my ward there are other parts of the city like where we are right now where it exceeds the national average and, and approaches 20 percent and at one time it was close to 30 percent of the people that are unemployed and, and, so, and as mayor it, because that's real. It's that's over real. Here. Folks in Ward 8 are hurting. Absolutely. Unemployment is, you know, terribly high. As mayor, how would you impact that and make that better? Well, I think as a government, you know, we employ over 30,000 people um, in our government. And one thing I know about folks is they want to work. They want a chance. Um, and there, they have some employment hurdles to get over in some cases. So I think the D.C. government has to do more for our returning citizens, for example. How are we going to help them get over those hurdles? We haven't figured that out yet. For people who don't have employment experience, is there something the government can do to help them get that experience? We've had some, uh, some fits and starts here and there with project empowerment, for example. But, you know, we have a program in our city, uh, the LEAF program. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. But it is, a, when this leaf season, our city cleans up leaves. And we hire people, <laughs> hire people temporarily to do it. And you know how bad people want those jobs? Every time the leaf season comes around, I have folks calling me up and says, you know, I want to get on that list to do that. So what that tells me is people want to work. Um, and we have to figure out as a government um, how, how to get them involved. I also sit on, on the Metro Board. Uh, Metro, big organization, regional organization, over 11,000 people. Uh, we have to get more D.C. residents hired. So I think our Department of Employment Services can do more to help employ, to help train and get our folks ready to take advantage of those Metro jobs. Why can't our folks be those bus drivers? Why can't our folks um, do those other uh, jobs at Metro that have great benefits and a chance for a middle class life? Okay, we want to continue, but again, we got to pay some bills. Maybe I should have booked you for two hours. Uh -oh. um, I'll come back. This, again, is the Rock Newman Show. Uh, don't touch that dial. Don't touch that computer. All of you that are watching around the world will be back in just a moment. show will be back after this. Koheka Acura's huge March sales event is going on now. Get one of the new 2013 hey. TLs for as low as $199 per month. Or get the brand new 2013 MDX for only $254 a month. Come find out why price and selection have made Koheka the world's largest. 
Take Action News with David Schuster, Saturdays from 12 to 3 on We Act Radio, 1480 AM and weactradio.com. Well, for me, it's always been, you know, you report the facts. You report like hell, let the chips fall where they may. And the truth, ultimately, the truth ultimately is what's going to sort of help our society and help all of us. I don't think progressives want a thumb on the scale on the facts. They just want the facts out there. You let the facts out and progressives will tell you, you know, we're going to win 70% of the time. Uh, you may quibble with the, the percentages or whatnot, but I think that's just sort of what progressives are looking for. And I think that's where this all sort of meshes with, with my interest as a journalist. And my interest, interest as a journalist is report the facts. Here's what's going on. Here's what the facts say. Here's what history says. Here are the lessons we know we have learned. And let people draw their own conclusions. And I think what's so unfortunate right now in the world of broadcast media is I do think that a lot of conservative radio, certainly conservative television, they're not interested in facts. And that's ultimately where I think conservative media is going to have its downfalls. That Americans are hungry. They're just hungry for basic information, hungry for basic facts. You report like hell, you let the chips fall where they may. I think it's it's natural for all of us who care, who are passionate about politics, who feel like we have a sense about the different between right and wrong. I think it's okay to let that be part of your cover. It's important for all of us as broadcasters and journalists, in this day and age, we have to be authentic. You can't be the person who's up in the ivory tower that comes down and tells people, now you must eat your peas. No, it's all about, we all have personalities, and I think it's being aware sometimes of our own bias, but also being open to the idea that sometimes we're wrong. But we have a dialogue, and we have a passionate dialogue, and we care about this country, we care about this community, and I think that sort of passion is what carries us through. Hear more from David Schuster, Saturdays from 12 to 3 on Take Action News, on We Act Radio, 1480 AM, and weactradio.com. The prodigal son of the DMV is back. Ladies and gentlemen, show your love for Rock Newman on The Rock Newman Show. June 27th is National HIV Testing Day. HIV testing is fast, painless, and often free. I've been tested for HIV. I've been tested for HIV. Have you? To find an HIV testing center near you, visit greaterthan.org. We Act Radio is a very proud partner of the Start at Westminster, a harm reduction, prevention, and awareness initiative sponsored by the Westminster Presbyterian Church right here in D.C. Start stands for syringe, treatment, advocacy, resources, training. These are the core elements of the harm reduction philosophy at Start. The goal of this program is to reduce transmissions of HIV, hepatitis, and other blood-borne infectious diseases by empowering those at risk of infection with the tools, resources, and referrals they need to take charge of their health. Over the past year, the Start at Westminster tested over 1,600 people, and they're averaging about 150 tests each month. And of course, with the proper funding, that number could go even higher. For more information on this terrific program, go to www.startatwestminster.org or visit the Westminster Presbyterian Church, 400 I Street Southwest, right here in Washington, D.C. The conversation that some people just don't care to have. We now rejoin the discussion on The Rock Newman Show. Hi, this is Mia. Um, I just um, just remembered that tomorrow, tomorrow I don't have any school, so I was, um, so I was wondering if we, we can hang out. Um, but if you have plans, that's okay. Bye. Love you. Ain't she too sweet? That's sweet. That's that's that's, that's my baby. This is the Rock Newman Show. In studio with us this morning is Muriel Bowser, council member from Ward Four, Washington D.C. And on last Saturday, she threw her hat in the ring to become Washington D.C.'s next mayor. Uh, let's go right to the audience, and we have a question from the audience for council member and mayoral candidate Muriel Bowser. Yes, my name is Crystal and I'm a Ward 7 district resident. Councilmember Bowser, you threw your hat into the ring last weekend. And my question is, how will you win in 2014 and what will separate you from the other candidates that will run? Well, thank you. Well, I don't know who's going to run. As far as I'm concerned, I'm the only one running. Uh, and what we're going to do and the reason why we're... Right now you are. I am. That's it's a true are. statement. <laughs> and well, let's keep it that way. How about that? Uh, but what we're going to do, Rock, for the next year, and Crystal, thank you for that question, is go to every ward, every neighborhood, and talk to every voter. You know, I've got 
gotten that question a couple of times. How are you going to win? What's your strategy? Are you going to target this? Are you going to target that? I don't want to be the mayor of the District of Columbia for a small slice of people. I want to be a mayor, the mayor of the District of Columbia uh, for all of the people. And in all of my campaigns, um, that's, that's been our approach. Um, and this one's going to be that and, and more. There has been so much talk. And you hear it all the time, and it's, I think it's only fair that we, we address it here also. Been so much talk about, <clears throat> I'd ask you about, you know, your influences, and you said Charlene Drew Jarvis, and you mentioned Adrian and, and other people. Uh, still, folks continue to talk about Adrian's influence that, you know, your, your, your political team uh, was very involved with Adrian's um, political career. Um, I want to ask you something because I thought that Adrian Fenty did a good, for the most part, did a good job as mayor. I thought that there was a disconnect from people, and I remember engaging Adrian in a discussion just about uh, what was going on with the um, Tennis and Learning Center and the people that were involved in that and, and former member, uh, uh, First Lady uh, uh, Cor Corberry mm -hmm. and the support of, you know, that they had for the center for Maya Angelou and um, um, Dorothy Height and, and crew in that. I gave him again humble or not so humble advice. I said, Adrian, man, a a public relations tsunami is going to hit you if you don't be more careful about how you address this issue and how you how you handle those ladies. And he gave me some advice. He said, enjoy Las Vegas, <laughs> um, and I did. And then he lost. Um, and certainly, I'm not saying I had anything to do with any of that. Why did he lose in 2010? Well, I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned, Rock, from um, from that election and certainly from uh, Mayor Fenty's four years in office. I think some good ones um, and some tough ones. And w w part of the lesson that I learned is to stay connected, stay in touch, and to listen. Um, and another lesson that I learned is that mayors have to make tough decisions and that people will come along with you even when the decisions are tough, if they understand them. So it makes sense um, to go out and explain and get people to understand all the information that you have and why you are moving in a certain direction. Um, so I think one of the biggest lessons learned is to make sure that you're constantly communicating and constantly explaining what you see as the mayor, because there's nobody in the city that has that vantage point. What you see see as the mayor as the necessary steps um, to get us where we need to go. As a mayor on a scale of 1 to 10 uh, and then I'm going to leave Fenty on a scale of 1 to 10 how would you have rated him his mayorship? Well, I think he got a, a lot of um, good and important things done. I think that there's been a, no other mayor who was able to get control of the schools, and I think that's important no matter who the mayor is, um, that we have singular accountability for how our schools move forward. Um, you know, Tony Williams tried, and he wasn't able to get it. That was an important. I think that his focus on uh, transforming recreation and park space was important, being progressive about transportation um, issues was important. So I think history will certainly um, be the judge. The voters uh, made a decision, a respected decision of the voters, and I'm ready to look to the future. Um, and that's what we know all elections are about, the future. On that same scale of 1 to 10, how do you rate Vince Gay Gray's performance as mayor? Again, I think that we will really know about uh, the performance of this administration, you know, some years down down the, the, the pike when we see how some of their plans take shape. So, if, are you talking about between now and the time that the next election comes, or are you talking about even sometime after that? I think it could be sometimes after that because when you look around the city even now, we're really seeing the impact of Tony Williams. 
really seeing the impact of Tony Williams and, and the plans uh, that, that he made for whether it be Noma or Southwest or attracting 100,000 new residents. We're really starting to see that take shape now. So would your position be that, that neither Adrian or Mayor Gray could take credit for some of what's going on now? Some some of what's going on now. I'm, I'm talking about some of the good because you know you, Absolutely. Just, you do walk around town and I, I mean I said this last week you know I mean you see these cranes and of course the mayor had the numbers on them he said yeah it's 59 of them out there and you know the city is is booming and so I know that you're running for this contest. You bet. But and you're running hard and that's a good thing. Um, but you don't feel as if there is any credit to be given to you know what the mayor has how the mayor has performed the last couple I years? I think there's a lot of credit to go around um, and certainly we can look uh, back to our, our previous mayors we can look back to our previous councils um, and members of the council uh, I think when I, I look at Charlene and I see some of the things that are happening downtown like the convention center and what's happening around the convention center I know it was her leadership when she was the chairman of the economic development Co committee um, those those many years ago we even can thank the control board for for some of the successes that we're we're seeing in terms of our fiscal health um, and yes I think there's a, there's a lot of credit to go around talk to us about statehood sure we need it how are we gonna get it uh, you know, I, I, I scratched my head about this rock, and I had a lot of time to think about it uh, in, the, in a, being retained by the Capitol Police uh, when many of us went down and protested for, for our, our rights. Um, and uh, I think it was over 90 people uh, from the District of Columbia uh, were, were arrested. And I talked to a lot of the statehood advocates while I was there, people who had been uh, protesting for statehood longer, certainly, than, than I have, about what, what has been the strategy, what has worked, what has not worked, and what are we going to do uh, differently? It's a travesty, and I, you know, I've, I've heard you talk about it, and I appreciate it. We especially like our friends from all over the region uh, to recognize what the problem is in the District of Columbia, recognize how it hurts us, and what they can do. Uh, when we and we have great friends in Maryland, and I heard, and I was so pleased to hear Rushern on your show talk about uh, what Governor O'Malley and other elected officials in Maryland think. Um, but we need those kind of partnerships in Virginia. We've had supporters in, in Virginia as well. But it's going to take a national strategy um, to get it done. And as unfair as it may seem, we also have to be, um, you know, good advocates for ourselves down on Capitol Hill. Okay. What, um, if you could talk about, let, let, I'll go back to this for a second. Just I'll run through a couple of things on uh, that uh, Mayor Gray touts as his reason to well well first of all he hadn't said he's running but I think that this is a a precursor to why he would say that he should run and that is that homicides are down to a 50-year low the district has added more than 1100 people a month coming into the district it's uh, hadn't been this populous since 1970 education enrollment is now 81,000 students has grown at a rate not seen in 45 years and fiscal responsibility was just clearly something Something he stated that you know there's a million plus dollar surplus, and as soon as he said that, I asked him if I could borrow twenty dollars. Right. Um, but what would you say is the primary difference from your vision to make Washington D.C. a better place, and why are you more qualified, capable, and able to be mayor than anyone else that might run? Well. Rock, I think that the the voters are going to decide. So you you started off by saying that he uh, that uh, the mayor deserves another four years. Well, that's a question for the voters, and that's Correct. exactly why we're going to be out for the next year talking to them, and they're going to get uh, to decide. I think, and, and certainly I've been on the council for six years, and so uh, I'm going to pat myself on the back along with everybody else for uh, the reason that the district has come to this. This point of, of fiscal stability. This tough g g give you some credit. Yes, also. absolutely. Right. Last time I checked, the council had the power of the purse and the final say on the budget, and so a lot of people have have gotten us um, to this to this point. So I think that it's important for.
for us certainly uh, to to embrace the successes of our past and uh, the successes of, of past um, administrations um, and it's also important for us to look to the future this is what people are telling me across the District of Columbia that they see a lack of kind of urgency and focus um, and they want to make sure that our government has the full attention of all leaders um, is, and, and is energetic about the future let um, me, and that's what I see as the let difference. me be urgent and get coach Lou on the line thank you for holding how you doing good morning I'm good we're short on time so kind of make it quick and I'm sure Muriel will do the same I feel Muriel is a good candidate because she's for the people you know um, like, like she said that um, the councilman set the, um, set the tone for the city in the direction that was going was the city was already moving four years ago before he even got to the mayor mayor thing he's not a person that be out there on the street like Murray will be out there trying to talk and, and act with the people especially as the seniors the seniors are the ones that teach the younger ones how to be out there you know and get out there and vote your vote count you know at one time is blacks wouldn't get out there and vote because they felt they feel though the people wouldn't for them so I feel though um not just saying I know Muriel, I feel the way as I watched her on ANC and how she grew, you know. She grew until, you know, she's for the people. And she has my vote and she has a lot of people, a followers that with me have their vote for her. Thanks, Lou. Lou, thank you very much for calling. You know, I certainly am of the, uh, of the belief that a strong competition creates better government absolutely and the more talented people that run for office uh the better off at the end of the day that the citizens can be this is going to be a race that um we are going to look forward to i want to ask you one quick question but let me say this Rob. yes this is not an exercise for us mm -hmm. in in um just going around because there's nothing better to do this is a race that we fully intend to win mm -hmm. um and this is the the type of encouragement that we're getting across the city and the energy even since last week. I've been um, extremely encouraged by it. Um, so I, I, we're gonna, I'm going to tell you what one of my constituents told me when I called her. She said, well, Muriel, step out there on faith and a good record. And I said, that's exactly what, um, what we're going to do. So we're going to put together a great team um, and we're going to run an energetic, smart campaign. Um, and then hopefully next year this time, we'll be talking to you about uh, getting ready to to, to take the lead of the city. Thanks for coming on the Rock Newman Show. Thanks, Rock. That's a wrap for the 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock hour. Uh, we're going to pause for the cause and be back shortly for a very interesting hour talking about hip-hop music, its impact, censorship, um, lyrics that have been banned, and all the rest regarding Rick Ross, Lil Wayne, and we're going to have a great studio participation on the Rock Newman Show. Show.